comes to me because I teach. Because I, I know what happens when I have to teach a, a course in literature that's in the core curriculum, which the students who are majoring in business, the semester before they're ready to graduate, take that course, because they have no intention of taking that course. But they can't graduate unless they take it. And they come in my literature masterpieces of literature class, and they get totally turned on. Totally too. They say, my God, I didn't know this book. Oh my, and they are discussing all kinds of stuff because you're teaching them, you're opening up to them that possibility. I watch it in my <coughs> son too, who has an MBA from Baruch. All of a sudden my son is reading novels. And he says, Mom, I need to just no. Well, who's, you know, why do we sit down and say, it's okay, why can we check it and get to it and whatever? Well, let them read that, but let them read something else, too. I wonder if we could use that as a segue to talk about your own influences, your own literary influences. So I'm curious, I made mean, the question is twofold. So what are the classics that informed you? Um, there's a moment in the novel where Anna is restless and she can't sleep at night, and what she reads is um, Jane Austen's um, yeah, Pride and Prejudice. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. I wonder if that's a moment that reflects something about your own uh, genealogy, your own sense of who you are as a writer. But then also the other question is, as a Caribbean American, Caribbean woman writer, um, who is it, who are some of your influences? So. The, the classics, I'm wondering, and then also do you come to writing through people like Paul Marshall, Michelle Clitt, or is it through African-American writers, or, or who? The books don't, the color of the writers, or the characters, uh, I, it makes no sense to me. It, it doesn't really matter to me. If it did, I'd be in real trouble, since the I grew up in an um, English colony, or the books I read were by English writers. I love them. They have inspired me. Um, I know big, I can recite um, by heart almost all of Keats' words. <laughs> you know that, <laughs> almost all of them. I know big sections of Tintin Abbey, uh, old, old intimations of, of mortality. I know the, um, the liver cut balance, you know, we just learn them. I know big sections of the, the introduction, the prologue to Chaucer's Day. We had to memorize these things, and they have sustained me. Um, if you read my novels, you see these quotes just flying through them. It's not because I think I'm smart. It's because the, this was the literature that kept me alive. Um, I read Jane Austen because the world is so convoluted, and in James Austen's world, everything is all, nobody lives far away. Um, you may have a little problem there in the beginning, but the sun is gonna come up tomorrow in the end. <laughs> you know, um, in a problematic world, I read Jane Austen from the beginning, her books from beginning to end, probably every two years, all the way to the end. And then I start again, I read them again. Not because they're great literature. <laughs> For me, man, maybe they are. Although Nightfall says that you know, Jane Austen can't write. <laughs> and what Nightfall says is <laughs> <it's> true. <laughs> you know, it's true. But um, yes, because it's great literature. Yes, because of what she says about human nature and human behavior and uh, sight. But also because it's comfortable to me. Believe it or not, it's a word I recognize. It's my grandmother's world. It's moving from Digger Martin to St. James, where I used to live. It's that same world. Um, I recall that I was called, my, you know, my name is Elizabeth, my family used to call me Betty. When I was 12 years old, I became Elizabeth because of Elizabeth Bennett. Why? You know, there was this woman standing up for herself, saying, I don't care. You could be good looking and you could have money, but I don't want you because I, of course, she gets them in the end, but <laughs> which, makes it, which makes it all worthwhile. But all those problems, 
um, I was Elizabeth Bennett at 12 years old. So, in this novel, um, she's talking to Paul, and Paul is like who? He went to school in the Caribbean, and so we all had to be Jane Austen. We all had to be a lot of Jane Austen. And he tell, when she says, oh, I'm reading Jane Austen, and he says, yeah, I know, I had to read it, but he doesn't have the same take that she has on Jane Austen. And she, he, she pushes him, and he says, well, you know what was going on in England when she was writing those stories? I knew what was going on in England. And so when you have them on the, on, in, in, those, in, in those novels, when they're walking along the beach or whatever, and there are ships in the harbor, you know what those ships are. And of course, um, the novel that really says it is in Mansfield Park. If you recall, in Mansfield Park, um, um, Bertram, Tom, what's Mr. Bertram, he's, he's just come back from Antigua. Well, what the heck was he doing in Antigua? And when Paul Fanny Price asked, so tell me, what went on in Antigua? There's silence. That's all Jane Austen says. That's all she says. All she says is that there's a fire. Well, when I was in high school, I skipped over that. I didn't know what it is, but now I do know. And Paul knows, so he tells her, I know why they skipped over it. Because you know what was there. So it's, it's, it's a mixture. But when you ask me about contemporary writers, again, it doesn't matter to me what the color is. I love, um, there are certain novels of Song of Solomon I loved. I went to it to be bonkers. <laughs> and I watch people trying to imitate it, particularly a new novel that was just come, the good boy who fell from the sky. I'm so angry about that novel. You know that novel? By Duru, her last name is Duru. Something it was on the bestseller list. It begins exactly like Song of Solomon, exactly. And nobody's saying that. Nobody's saying, you know, this is. But for me, the novels I love are by um, Kutsio. Does that put me back in the English group? He's from South Africa. Ian McEwen. Does that put me back in there? But Philip Roth, not his big fat novels, his small novels, <laughs> especially his current his current novels, and probably because he's dealing with issues that I'm dealing with, which is issues of your mortality, issues of, of illness, or whatever. And neither, none of those right, they are not even female, mm -hmm. and they are fine. So it doesn't matter to me. I'm just saying, why can't you see yourself in books by black writers? Well, for one, they're not being published. For one, they're not being published, so you, you don't get a chance to see yourself. A very intelligent, smart guy, a lawyer, I won't hold that against him, <laughs> just said it straight out to me. He's white. He said to me, well, I don't read books by black writers because it's not my experience. It doesn't discuss. I said, yeah, we're all writing about the human condition. All, and writers do exactly the same thing. They talk. The, you're being taught the more specific you are, the more universal your appeal would be. How come when I talk about my specifics, it can't be universal? And of course, that's the big advantage of a novel by a black writer. It allows you to test your, um, to, it challenges your comfortable beliefs and values. It's only when you see yourself in the other that you get a chance to grow, really. Keep talking to yourself all the time, or to your group all the time, but you know, you're still in the same place. So I think it's important. Maybe if we can step back and talk about um, one of the boundaries I see you breaking as a writer is that um, a lot of Caribbean literature focuses on representing the folk. Mm -hmm. And I would say the corpus of your work focuses on representing middle class characters, commanders, mores. Um, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit about why you are invested in representing that particular sector of Caribbean society, um, which would get, get talked about as less authentic. Exactly. Exactly. I get criticized for that a lot, that my, right, my characters are not authentic. Well, two things. That's, the, that's, the, that's my favorite. 
not just my background, it was my parents' background, not just my parents' background, my grandparents' background. This is, this is the, and, and they have, you know, this is the world I know. And it's a pretty big world, it's not a little world. Um, and also, I once was, my, my first novel, um, when rock starts, I played with the folk a little bit. I have to say, play with the folk a little bit. One of my sisters came up to me and she said, Elizabeth, what the heck do you know about Obia? What the heck do you know about this life? What are you writing about that for? You don't know this life. Um, I can't quite agree with her, but what I will say is that I remember going to another conference very soon after, and there was a woman in the group who got up and lambasted um, writers of color for writing about the folk. She said, you guys are middle class, educated writers. What the heck do you do? You're just making money on us. You're not, you're not, you, these are not lies, you know. And we, we, don't, we can't read it to know whether you're accurate or not. And you're spreading these ideas about us and you don't really know our lives. And I said, you know, I'm gonna write about the people I know. I'm gonna write about the lives I know. And there's a lot to write about because there's a lot to write about. Um, for example, my family, um, my father, who I think and still believe is the most brilliant person I've ever known, I mean, he just was a genius. He was just a plain old genius. But he was, <laughs> no, he really was. And he also had a photographic memory, which he always had. He can look, read a book, and pretty much tell you almost everything you know, almost verbatim in the book, which got him in a lot of trouble from the time he was in high school. Um, you know, we have to take those A-level exams. He takes the A-level exam, and he scores almost 100 in physics, and he is accused of cheating. Well, he didn't cheat. That's how it was. So they give the scholarship to the British expat. Uh, you know, these scholarships, one of the ones that Knight Boy got, and then they came back to him later on and offered to have him do medicine, uh, to do law, medicine or law, got into both of them and he decided to chuck both of them. He didn't do either. But um, I lived with him. I lived with this very brilliant man who was in a, I don't think he was arrogant. I think it's his, he just didn't suffer fools gladly. <laughs> Not that he was arrogant. And saw what it was for him to be working with people who were English people, colonial sorts, that he could wrap around his finger. Um, so that's a thing, you know, that's another life. That's something else to talk about. And it was very real. And how it affected us, and it did affect. Um, I'll tell you one little snippet. Um, um, he reached a point where a lot, once the, the country became independent, so there's going to be a lot of corruption because people get their hands on money that they didn't have before. And of course, we have oil. And, and um, <laughs> this would make Americans feel good here because the British were drilling for oil and they, they finally reached a point where no more oil was coming out. So there were two things were happening at the same time. We were getting independence and they felt they had depleted all the oil. This is until the Americans came with some newfangled drills and went down <laughs> and, then, and found out we had an oil belt running from Venezuela right under the sea, right in the south of Trinidad. But just at that point, uh, my father was at this point an administrator at Shell. And he, um, want to get a story? <laughs> 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 at this point he was in, and when we, and this is in, this is in Bangladesh, because I have a fictional cat, or in, an in between, I think it's in an in between, where we, when he got that position, we then were moved, our family moved to live in the um, area that they had for the expats. And I was fell out. I didn't believe a place like that existed in Trinidad. All of a sudden you came to manicured lawns, swimming pools, beach, special beach, golf course, everything else. And so I'm one of 11. So then my father comes on this place with 11 black children. And um, it, it was a nightmare. 
for him and for us. Uh, I think in one of, in Anna in between, I describe a scene where this Anna is in the swimming pool and they drained it. Well, this happened to my two sisters, you know, because it's hot in the place. They go swimming in the pool, they drain the darn pool. Um, once my father was in the stands and we were on passing on going to the beach, which was at the edge of the golf course, they sent the police, the police are off. You're in your own country, you know, you're in your own country. And um, so I had seen that situation happen. Um, I mean, on the other hand, people were admiring us and saying how fortunate you, you were, but we weren't. We were dealing with that situation there. And then once independence came, then there was another story. Yeah, that's what I was saying, that once independence came, he then, he, he left, he then took a, a break from Shal and then um, he worked until he was in his late 80s as independent. 